Good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about the community services and development industry insights specifically for the New Zealand market. So for those of you who haven't been to one of these industry insight webinars before, I'm going to run you through a few details before we get underway. So probably the first thing to do is just give you a bit of a background as to who I am and what I do at SEEK. So my name's Narelle Stefanak, I'm the National Client Training Manager at SEEK and I've been running these industry insight webinars for the last 12 months or so and we've covered quite a few and I'll give you the list in a moment uh, but if you feel like you need to take any questions offline with me later today by all means do that you can reach out to me either via email phone you can tweet in fact we will be running with a hashtag for today so the hashtag will be seek data and you can either uh, send it out to the the handles Narelle Stefanak or seek jobs NZ we also have a blog which is really specific to people who are responsible for hiring. So if you want to get the latest information and insights on what's actually happening in the marketplace, by all means reach out to that blog URL there, insight.seek.co.nz. Now in terms of how we're going to facilitate questions today, because we do have a few of you on the line, we'll get you to type questions in as we go. So what that means is I want you guys to sort of kick back, relax, enjoy the session. If something sort of spurs your interest, type a question in the question box. If you can't find it, there's a little red box with a white arrow. Click on that and that'll open up this little question area. What we will do is we'll send you a copy of this presentation, a bit of a summary uh, page as well around what the key findings are and a report for you to be able to download. So ultimately you'll have everything at your fingertips so you don't have to scribble madly. I guess the idea of today is that we're going to go through quite a lot of data. So in terms of what we've covered so far, we've covered pretty much almost all the classifications. So if you your business sits across multiple disciplines, so it's not just focused on the community services and development area, and you're particularly interested in any one of these other areas, please send me an email. Let me know which industries you're particularly interested in, and we'll make sure we share those findings with you. As for the rest of 2015, we have about another seven to go. So these are the last classifications that we'll be covering for 2015. And uh, by all means, if you want to register for any of those, also let me know. They're all free events and all the reports are available to you. So just reach out, let us know what you're interested in. We'll make sure we get you up to speed. So in terms of today, I guess, look, the main thing that I really want you guys to get out of today is that you can walk away and really think, you know what, I'm a subject matter expert in this industry. I know it inside and out. I know where to get the information I need. I know how to read it. I know how to interpret it and then manage the hiring manager's expectations appropriately. Because what you need in your roles is the ability to control the recruitment process. If you can control it, what happens there is you be, you're able to sort of open up the whole job briefing component. So when you're sitting down with hiring managers, really setting their expectations for what the process is going to look like. And that way you have a real brief that you can action. I mean, I don't know how many times uh, I have had to do this, but um, uh, previously to SEEK, I worked in the recruitment industry. So the one thing that I absolutely hated was having to rework an ad or rework a job. Okay, so you've gone out to market, you've tried to attract the, that needle in the haystack that the hiring manager wants, and then you've failed dismally, so you have to start again and negotiate. Go, okay, well, what we aimed for isn't there, so what do we do now? Okay, so what we're trying to do is alleviate that process even occurring. We give you all the data and insight you need so you can be really well informed, so you can provide consultative advice out to those hiring managers before you even start to lift a finger. So if you can do that, I'll be very, very happy. So what we're going to do to help you along the journey is we're going to give you some independent industry insights first. Okay, so this is not SEEK data. Uh, I look through a number of different sources to be able to obtain information about what's going on in the industry category for community services and development. And I basically compiled a couple of little bits of research which will help you get a really clear view at a macro level of what's happening and what you can expect for the future. We'll then move into the SEEK-based data because SEEK-based data is great in terms of that it's month-to-month -month updates, so it's almost real time, so you get a really good feel for supply and demand, how in supply are the candidates that you're targeting and how in demand are, them, are they, so are you going to have to compete really heavily for them? 
The next component is looking at salary. So are we being competitive enough and what do we need to do to move the dial or what should we be communicating out to those candidates to really attract the right level in? Finally, the little bit at the end is all around behaviours. So what are these candidates actually physically doing when they're either actively or passively looking at opportunities? So we'll go through what that looks like both from a desktop and mobile perspective. But ultimately, I expect that, you know, this, these four buckets will take about 20, 20 to 25 minutes to run through and we'll have time for questions at the end, but we'll also answer questions as we go. So definitely reach out or if your preference is Twitter, as I mentioned earlier, the hashtag we're running with today is seek data. All right, let's jump into things. There's a bit to cover, right? Um, for those of you who have just joined us, we will be sending out a copy of the presentation. So please don't feel like you have to scribble every piece of detail down. We'll make sure we give it to you. It will most likely come out tomorrow. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is some independent data and it's usually compiled by the MBIE, so the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment, um, but there's other bodies that actually do some rolled up summaries that are actually quite clever. So I'm actually using Career NZ as the source this time. And the reason why I'm doing that is they actually have broken out a number of occupational groups. Uh, so within this community services sector, they're looking at case managers, community workers, health promoters, social workers, youth workers. Okay, and they're looking at the total number of people employed in that category. And if we look at it over a rolling trend over the last couple of years, there's been about a 2% growth year on year in this category. And for New Zealand, that would be described as moderate. Okay, so on average, the national average for growth across the um, employment uh, category across New Zealand is anywhere between 2 to 2.5% two year on year. And that's at the moment, that's actually, you know, quite good growth, um, but we're expecting that to sort of settle down. Post GFC, there's been a, definitely a bit more of an influx, but we're expecting that to settle down over the longer term to probably growth rates of around 2%, maybe 1.9%. So we do see a little bit of a softening. But this particular industry is really interesting because even though employment numbers may not necessarily surge, they will continue to grow marginally, but there's massive turnover. And that's probably the pinch point that you guys are feeling. Um, when Career NZ broke this, these occupational groups out, they indicated how easy or difficult they expected these areas to be to recruit for and, and over a projected period. Okay, so what they're expecting is that pretty much everywhere, all of these roles are going to be in high demand. Okay, there's one which is health promoter right in the middle of your screen. They're expecting it to be in moderate demand, largely because that is one area of stability in this category where people don't churn really quickly. But everywhere else there's either a skill shortage, there's a talent shortage, there's just a shortage of workers, or there's high turnover. So even when you look at case managers, employment numbers in that particular category have actually shrunk over the last couple of years. But just due to the significant amount of high turnover, you know, this is a really intense job dealing with really difficult problems. And so having a talent pool, having people lined up, being able to support your case managers, thinking about how you're going to retain them, uh, even if it means that you need to second them into different roles and then get them back into those later on. Uh, so having some sort of succession planning is going to be really key in being able to retain them, but also looking at how do we build out really robust talent pools for these types of roles. Community workers is just a shortage of these candidates. Social workers is probably interesting because it's a really skilled area. It's probably the only one where you require a degree qualification. Um, and as such, it's actually listed on the long-term skill shortage list for NZ. So thinking about how do we actually get these workers in, one, because we just don't have them and it's a problem nationally. Uh, two, how are we going to attract them from international sources and how competitive is our opportunity in comparison. So we'll talk a little bit more about social workers as we go through this slide because I think it's something to really keep on your radar. Uh, the other one is youth, um, youth workers as well. The really interesting thing about youth workers is that they really only stay for a short term, okay, really short term stints. So again, it's about talent pooling. How do we get more candidate flow? So when I look at across all of these indicators, I guess the big thing that screams out to me is that running with a job ad alone 
which is basically a real-time need, may not be your perfect solution. Okay, so when you guys advertise with Seek, as part of your contract, you have two things you can do. You can run a job ad and you can also search for talent across our talent pool where we have more than 3 million people registered and say, hey, reach out to me. I'm happy for you to approach me about opportunities. Now, if you're not using that talent search function to be able to proactively source talent or start building out robust talent pools, um, please let us know. It is free for you to access. You just may not be aware of it because it's relatively new, uh, but it's free to use and we want to encourage you to start doing it, especially for this discipline where you really do need to build out some robust talent pools. So if you're not aware of that, let us know. We'll take it offline um, and we'll make sure we get uh, you all across the details of how you would manage that. All right, so that's the independent stuff. The stuff that you can get from Seek, and we update this monthly, but I usually produce it every sort of six months, so um, keep an eye out for the data. Uh, what we look at here is how in demand are these candidates and is the demand outpacing the supply of talent? Okay, because this is pretty important. Like if you have lots and lots of candidates but um, and no jobs, well, you're probably going to have to think about how you're going to screen those. You know, you're going to get inundated with applications. On the flip side, what happens if there's lots of people or lots of companies wanting the same really small pool of talent? What are you going to do then? Okay, so we need to know where those things in, uh, intersect. So the best way for us to measure supply and demand is by looking at the average applications per ad. So the key thing that we look at here is an index. So it's not just a linear scale, it actually shows you, so if you could imagine, um, let's say housing and homelessness services get one application per ad on average, then you would be confident to say that community development would get about two, um, employment services would get about two and a bit, uh, aged and disabled support would get about almost two and a half, you know, so you can start to see on a linear gauge or on a, an indexed gauge, you know, how easy or difficult different areas will be. By far, housing and homelessness services is, attracts the lowest average applications per ad. So if this is an area that you're recruiting in, then I think the main thing that we need to think about is how do we actually communicate this with the hiring manager? Okay, so the hiring manager said, okay, Sue's just resigned, she specialises in housing um, and we need another Sue. All right, well, the first thing I'd be saying is, well, that housing is the most difficult role to resource for in New Zealand. So how flexible are you going to be? Right, so we need to set their expectations up because three years ago they might have had to hire a Sue and it was easy to recruit for. Well, the market's changed and this is a real-time lens of what areas are easier or more difficult to resource for based on the volume of applications in real time. Now, the other thing that I'd look at is, well, how are we going to go about our talent sourcing? You know, is a job ad alone really going to cut it? Do we really need to be more proactive? Should we be doing a combination of search and advertising? Uh, on the flip side, you can see sort of around the management, fundraising, volunteer, coordination and support. Those three is where we're getting a little bit more uh, volume of applications. It's not dramatically more. It might be double, right? So if you said housing got 10, then management might get 20. Right, it's not massive amounts more. So again, you still might have to apply the same theory. Will advertising alone get the talent that we want? In fact, a really good thing to think about is when you're advertising, because obviously you would have had to advertise across one of these subclassifications previously, were you happy with the candidates that you received? Were they what you were looking for or were they really didn't meet the mark? You know, if you're finding that you're attracting candidates that don't meet your standards, that don't, that can't perform the role, so you're attracting more noise than quality, then there's probably two things that could be going wrong. One, your job ad could be really terrible, right? That's a possibility. But second, you're just attracting any candidates that are interested in you. What you need is a little bit more control of the process, so you want to be able to tap into that search capability and really reach out find the candidates with the right skills, the right attributes, and then proactively target them. Make sure you get your ad in front of them. Make sure you're reaching out to them with targeted messaging. Make sure that you're downloading their CVs. You know, all of these sorts of things are tools that you can utilize. So this can help you do two things. One, determine how you're going to manage the hiring manager's expectations, and two, determine what your sourcing strategy is going to look like. 
Now once you know how easy or difficult it is to resource for, then you probably want to know where those candidates are. Right, so if you're looking at um, housing and homeless services, then the lion's share of candidates are in Auckland. Okay, no surprises there. Majority of the population sits in Auckland and is our dominant uh, location where majority of uh, candidates are actually searching for opportunities. But it also means that you can see where the candidates are in low supply or low engagement numbers. So it gives you an idea. So if you're in Wellington, then you can say, well, the line share of candidates are either in Auckland or Canterbury. We really need to be looking in those two markets if we can't find the talent locally. Okay, again, it positions you with the hiring manager that you actually understand not only the national macro trend of where candidates are difficult to source, but also that micro trend of, well, where is that talent if you're looking for it? Now the next thing you need to really work out is are we going to be competitive enough? And I'm going to talk about this in a fair bit of detail and I'll give you a particular example in a moment. But we capture minimum and maximum salary bands because we ask you for it when you post your ad and we publish them. Okay, so if you're looking at say let's do child welfare, youth and family services because this is what I prepared earlier. <laughs> if you're looking at this particular occupation and the hiring manager says, look, I'm only willing to pay 40K. Well, the barrier that you're going to have is that the average salary listing in this category is anywhere between 44 to 55. Okay, that's what other people are listing out in the open marketplace in January this year. Okay, that were the average salary bands used. So we're not going to be competitive. So ultimately we need to say, well, what other things do we do? What other benefits can we really talk about? Why would someone want to come and work for us on a lower salary than what the market is offering? Why would they want to do that? Okay, what's the benefit? Is it our brand? Is it the benefits that we offer? Is it because we do something special? Is it the flexibility of shifts? We really need to be able to strongly articulate that because we just can't compete on salary alone. Or maybe our salaries need to be revised. Maybe we should go and explore, is it possible? Do we need to review this? Do we need to be more competitive? Can we be more competitive? Now, I'm going to, the reason why I want to talk about this one, this child welfare, youth and family services, is because this is sort of where your social workers sit. Right, so if you think about social workers, um, what we see on the New Zealand website is that people typically split the volume of ads between this classification or subclassification and the other one that they put um, social workers in is the healthcare, psychology, counselling and social work. Right, there's sort of a split between the two. Now from a salary perspective, there's a 10K difference. Right, so in community services and development, this social workers would pretty much get that 44 to 55 K band mark. Whereas in healthcare under psychology, counselling and social work, the average salary that's listed there is 54 to 65. Okay, so again, it's another talking point that you could have with a hiring manager that, you know what, we could target someone more in that healthcare discipline with a psych background, but they're most likely going to be degree qualified and they're going to be demanding at least an extra 10K in their salary expectations. So we could broaden out to that scope, but we've got to be willing to move with those salary expectations. Okay, the other thing to think about is internationally, because social workers, they fall on the skilled migration list. So if you need to target candidates internationally, how competitive are you going to be with salaries, right? So I had a look at the Australian salary offerings for this same band and for child welfare, youth and family services, it's 61 to 67, okay, right, so we're talking almost 20 grand more in the salary band. And if we looked into that psychology, counselling and social work, that sort of fits under healthcare, then that's 67 to 84. Okay, you can start to see how this can really blow out. So if they say, yeah, we're willing to take uh, internationals, then maybe we need to consider, well, are we going to be able to get them or are we going to go down the path and then them fall off in the end? Because they might look great on paper and they might be fantastic to meet with, but we just can't bridge the gap with salary. Okay, all this sort of stuff is super important and if you can use salary as a lever with your hiring managers to get them to say, well, actually, we don't need a degree or we don't need 
them to have that qualification or we don't need them to have that much experience. We could go with this much experience. Okay, what we're looking for is a little bit of flexibility so that your brief can be a bit broader. When the hiring managers are presented with candidates that are a broad mix, they can say, yes, they're all within my scope and I like this candidate more than that candidate. Okay, but ultimately we want them to consider everyone. And so I'd use the whole macro level data around how the, the category is growing and the skill shortages and how easy or difficult it is to resource um, and the projected growth. I'd use that as a macro trigger with hiring managers. Then I'd use the micro triggers of supply and demand, where the talent resides and what the salaries are to really push them about a bit, right? You want your hiring managers to give you a bit of room to move. And that way they'll see you as a subject matter expert and they'll give you a really robust brief that you can work to and you can fill the job. All right, let's wrap up with some behavioral stuff. Okay, so when we're looking at search behaviours, uh, we look across mobile and desktop to see how things have evolved and they've sort of evolved pretty rapidly in New Zealand. Okay, so if we look at mobile, mobile in October last year was 42% of all visits. I haven't got the updated number yet. That's going to be released most likely this month. Uh, so I'm expecting that number is probably going to be closer to 50%. Okay, it's going to be up around 46 perhaps uh, percent of all visits are via a mobile device. So we are definitely seeing a massive shift towards mobile. So if they're creating searches in this environment, we need to make sure that they're having a really positive experience. So when you create your ad, you only create it once. And what we do is we pop it up on the desktop computer and we also splash it out across iPhones and Androids and tablets, every single mobile device you could possibly imagine. But we sort of customise it so that it works and it renders well. It's all sort of mobile optimised. What you need to do is make sure your content is structured in a way that candidates can actually read it. Okay, there's nothing worse than a candidate looking on their mobile phone, wanting to make a quick decision and the screen is just full of clutter. So if you need more coaching on ad writing, please let us know. I run separate events. My next ad writing event will be in April. So we'll do that in April. That's a free webinar as well. Uh, but it really does focus on what does a good ad look like both for desktop and mobile. The other thing to consider is how they search. So what we've seen is a really big evolution towards keyword. Keyword is now used 70% of the time when someone comes to visit the SEEK website. So if someone's searching, they'll still use a classification, they'll still use a location, and they'll probably use a keyword to either get to a specific job title or a range of job titles, or to actually refine the list by a particular skill or industry or work type or level. Okay, so that, they're sort of the clusters that they're looking at. So I guess my big tips for you are use job titles that make sense. Okay, if you have a fancy job title, don't use it. If they're a social worker, call them a social worker. Okay, because that's what people are searching on, job titles that make sense. Location has always been really important to candidates. So wherever you can, use the location and the granular area breakdown. Sometimes our, our area breakdowns aren't granular enough. So if you can publish the suburb, write the suburb somewhere in your ad. Okay, what we will do is we'll use our algorithms to scrape those ads out and then surface them to candidates. Okay, so if someone's looking for jobs in Taranaki, we can actually find that. Okay, so being able to break out those, those locations is going to be really important. Classification, look, I think the main thing is it, Candidates will still search across a category, so they want to see what are all the opportunities across community services and development. Often that happens when they're in a browsing mode. So just choose the right category and try and choose a subclassification other than other. <laughs> okay, I know that's difficult sometimes. If you've got nowhere else to put it, fine, pop it in other. But candidates don't often go, oh, I would really love to see what opportunities sit in other. Right, it's not a natural thought process. So we want to try and avoid it wherever we can. Um, but what we're doing from a SEEK perspective is we're using a lot more of the intelligence of the keywords that they're entering to be able to surface the right match to roles. So if you're writing your ads with the right language, you're using um, information that makes sense, 
to candidates so it's not jargon. Okay, trying to avoid all the jargon that's just relevant to you. If it's relevant to the industry, fine, but if it's relevant only to you, that's when I'd be concerned. Now, because keyword features quite a bit here, I thought you'd all like to know the keywords. So here they are. And you can see it sort of splits between the job title and industry. So realistically, if you do know the job title and you think, yeah, that doesn't sound right, I need to change it, I'd encourage you to change it. Okay, if the, are they the chief executive officer in charge of people? That, that doesn't really help me understand what I'm doing. So maybe they're a social worker. Yeah, so just thinking about those little elements. Um, describing what industry you're in, you know, most advertisers in this space execute this pretty well. Uh, but this is just a really helpful way for you to be able to go at a glance, are we doing it right, yes or no? Are we missing the mark? Have we got a bit of internal push around using really fancy words? And if so, can I use this to push back and tell them it's not going to connect with those target candidates? So I guess the key things that I want you to take out of today is I want you to really understand your candidate market. Okay, what are the difficult roles to source for? What sort of salaries are being offered and are we being competitive enough? Um, what are we really looking to do with these candidates? Do we need to uh, just get that real-time in-demand candidate applied to our roles or do we need to start talent pooling and really searching for that talent, really getting a, a really clear headspace around what the marketplace means to you? And then I really want you to position yourself as that subject matter expert. Okay, how do you stand up in front of a hiring manager when you're taking a job brief? And before you enter into anything, you can sit there and say, well, you know what, this is either going to be easy or difficult to resource for and these are the reasons why. And this is what I recommend we should be doing as a result. Okay, that really consultative advice that you can provide to hiring managers will position you extremely well in your business and you will be called upon for advice and you'll be given a brief that you can actually work to. Finally, just diversify. If you have not thought about changing the way you've always done things, I think you should. Okay, the whole employment marketplace has evolved dramatically over the last five years from big data algorithm capabilities right through to search capabilities and the way that you connect and engage with candidates, both through social but also through mobile devices. So thinking about what could we be doing to really enhance our processes but also enhance the way that we connect with talent. So if you need any more advice on those things, please reach out and let us know. Uh, but I'll open the floor for questions. Um, we have a couple of minutes before we wrap up. So if you have any questions for me, please type them into your question box now and I'll make sure I answer those for you. For the rest of you who uh, need to run away, you can have a two-minute early mark. Thank you again for joining us. We'll send you a copy of this presentation most likely tomorrow. We've also recorded the session, so if there's anyone within your business that you think really needs to play it, see it, hear it, uh, we'll send you a link to the recording uh, as well. And if you have any questions, by all means, reach out. But thank you again for joining us today, and I'll stay on the line now just in case any questions pop through. Thanks, guys. So we'll close the session there. Thank you very much for joining us today and good luck with your talent acquisition strategies for the remainder of 2015. Thanks, guys.